Um, go to the book of Acts, of course, Acts chapter 13, verse 1, and I'm moving. Um, Acts chapter 13, verse 1, among the prophets and teachers of the church of Antioch, at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon called the black man. That's weird. I'm not going to explain it. I'm just moving on. Lucius from Cyrene, Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. Notice Barnabas is first in that list. Saul is at the end of that list. You're going to see the way uh, Barnabas and Saul are talked about are in that pairing as a partnership. It's always Barnabas and Saul. By the end of this passage, it's going to be Paul and Barnabas. And that matters. It's just the order of the ministry. So these are the five elders of the church of Antioch. We talked about the birth of the Antioch church a few weeks ago. These are the five elders. The elders are the main leaders of that church. Depending on the tradition that you grew up in, they may have been called elders. They may have been called deacons, might have been called presbyters, might have been priests, might have been bishops. These are called elders here. And notice they've got specific Holy Spirit gifting. They are powerful teachers and prophets. Teachers and prophets just... Very simply, a teacher is someone who can explain a concept to you so that you understand it and you can walk in it. A prophet is someone who, um, they might be a teacher as well, but, but they get a specific message from God, a, a supernatural message from God in the moment for a person or for a group of people, and they're meant to share that message with that person, and that's a prophet. So these spiritual gifts are going to be important in the message. Verse 2, one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So they're just, they're just worshiping, right? They're just they're having a prayer meeting, and immediately God comes in and speaks and says, you're going to take two of your top leaders in your church and you're going to send them out as missionaries. This would have been a really big deal. Imagine God coming into your church and saying, I'm going to take your two favorite pastors and send them somewhere else. That's tough. But we need to have a missionary spirit, yes? Yes. And we need to always have in front of us the fact that Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we're meant to send leaders out into the world so that others can hear. The other thing I want you to notice is that they were worshiping the Lord. Now that phrase that's there, some of your translations might say that they were ministering to the Lord. And it's an, it's an odd, it's an interesting phrase, but ministering to the Lord is actually closer. So they're not ministering to each other. They're not, they're not uh, serving each other. They're not serving anybody else. They're serving the Lord. So the nature of their prayer meeting is it's like they're giving gifts to God. And so um, I've talked about this before, but just to say it again, in the average church service, the way it normally goes is the first part of the service when we're singing songs, that is you giving gifts to God. You're the one who's worshiping. You're the one who's giving God your heart, your thanks, your gratitude, right? Your, your love, you're expressing all those things in the words that you sing to him. It's why some of us feel kind of uncomfortable during the singing. It's because it's so active. During the message, a lot of times we're sitting in a seat like you are right now and we're receiving a gift. But do you see how it flips? So they were having a prayer meeting where it was very intentional. They were giving their gifts to God during that service. That's what this coming Wednesday night is going to be with our worship night. Is It's going to be the entire time is going to be devoted to you giving gifts in song to God. If you've never done that before, it's a, it's a great step in your spiritual life. Uh, verse three. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and they sent them on their way. And so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Notice here that the text, Dr. Luke tells us they weren't just sent out by the elders of Antioch. They were sent out by God himself. So they were a part of that. But God was really behind it. And that's what we pray all of our actions are. Amen. Um, It says that they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And as you continue to read the rest of this chapter, you're just going to see that they start traveling around, preaching the gospel and planting churches. Now, this tiny little verse here, I've got to kind of blow it up for you for just a second. It just says that he sent them out and they went. But there's a whole lot that happened in the midst of that. If you look at it closely and you think it through, the... the, um, 
uh, trip that they're about to go on, Barnabas and Saul, it's probably a one to two year trip. This missionary trip, this is one of maybe four missionary trips that the Apostle Paul took before the end of the book of Acts. And this one's one to two years of traveling around the ancient world, the Mediterranean area, and planting new churches. And so how do you pack for one to two years? How long does it take to pack and to figure out what goes and what stays? And how, how much time did they spend raising money? Because they needed money for travel and food and all that kind of stuff, right? So they had to find donors who also heard the Holy Spirit and believed in them. They had to access some maps because there wasn't Siri at that time to figure out where in the world are we going to go and what's our route going to be and what kind of boats are we going to take and all that kind of stuff had to happen in there. And some of you guys are gifted in the way of administration and organization and your mind's being blown right now. But there's a lot to do. Verse 6 Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island, that's the island of Cyprus, until finally they reached Paphos, which is a city where they met two people, okay? A Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Say Bar-Jesus. It just means son of Jesus. That seems weird to us because Jesus is sort of a big deal to us, right? Um, Bar-Jesus, Jesus is actually a very common name in the New Testament. And so this wasn't Jesus, this was just another Jesus, and he was... His son, Bar Jesus, he had attached himself to the governor. This is a Roman governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. And the governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him for he wanted to hear the word of the Lord. So I just want you to imagine the main council room of that governor. And there's four people standing there. There's the Roman governor of the entire city. And there's this weird sorcerer Jewish guy named Bar-Jesus. And then there's Saul and Barnabas. It's just those four. Um, now, Bar-Jesus, it says he's a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet. That's weird. Why is it weird? Because if you know your Old Testament, sorcery is not part of Judaism. In fact, it's, it's, it's very much condemned by God in the Old Testament as this is not the thing that we do. That's you accessing evil resources, not accessing God. And so sorcery is out. So for him to be a Jewish sorcerer, how do you do that? And a false prophet, which means you're making empty prophecies that aren't actually from God. And that's important. Remember that later. Just because someone comes to you and tells you that they're speaking for God doesn't mean they're right. The verse we're going to read later says you, you need to test the prophets. You need to take them to God and you need to look for the amen of the Holy Spirit about that. So he was a false prophet. Scholars tell us he was something that, that we call a syncretist. Say syncretist. You said a very fancy word already. See, your Sunday's successful. A syncretist. Uh, what does a syncretist mean? A syncretist is somebody that takes multiple religions and philosophies, and they cherry pick the parts that they like, and they put them together into their own thing. That's a common thing, right? And that's, that's what he was doing back in those days. And what he had was no truth at all because he had kind of rolled his own, so to speak. He had kind of made his own thing and he was going forward with his own thing. And that made him a very dangerous person. Why is he a very dangerous person? Because as soon as you start making up your own religion, it's not truth. See, Christianity is based on this idea that God is actually real. And that at one point in eternity past, God decided to reveal the truth about himself to us. And so what we are at the end of the day is we are truth seekers. Amen. We, we, we're seeking what is real, not what is made up. And we're not making decisions based on our preferences and what we like. I've got a picture from a popular movie for you. I'm not affirming this movie in any way. Just say that. <laughs> but maybe you've seen it, or maybe you've seen the, the, the clip of it, but the family's gathered around the table, and they're all having an argument about what kind of Jesus they like to pray to. And they've all got their own special version. And it's very much a preference thing. And you very much walk away kind of laughing at this idea of everybody's kind of executing on their preferences of what they want Jesus to actually be for them. 
and I'm making it sound bigger than it actually is. I'm kind of explaining the joke away, but isn't it real? Part of the reason that it's so funny and we laugh so much is isn't it kind of real? Because there are things that make us uncomfortable about Jesus. But if he's real and if he's the truth, then you accept him no matter what. He's not the one that you shape to your preferences. You're the one who gets shaped by him is the way that that works. Otherwise, it's poison. 2 Peter 1.16 says it like this. For we are not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. Peter is saying everything that we wrote to you, we didn't make it up. It's not legend. And we didn't add extra special no, it's, it's truth. They gave historical accounts to us and we learn and pursue that truth. So back to our story in Acts. Acts chapter 13, verse eight. But Elymas, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek. So we're back to bar Jesus again. And Dr. Luke just gave him a different name, gave us his Greek name. I think personally it's because Dr. Luke does not like saying he, him and Jesus in the same sentence. So he gave us his Greek name. So don't get confused by it. He said, this guy, the sorcerer, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Why would he do that? He doesn't tell us, but read between the lines. He's got a man here of great influence politically. He's the governor of the whole city. And he's got his ear. And now all of a sudden, Barnabas and Paul are going to come along and He's going to lose that influence. So he's controlling, selfish, jealous, and tries to stop at verse 9. Saul, also known as Paul. So this is where we get Paul's name for the first time in the book of Acts. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. and He looked the sorcerer in the eye and said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you ever stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? big. So just real quick, Saul and Paul were used to like Peter being, or Simon be renamed to Peter, right? Abram to Abraham. We don't get a moment like that with Paul. Um, It is likely that Saul was his Jewish name because he had a Jewish mother. He had a Roman father and his Roman name was probably Paul. Because he's the apostle to the Gentiles, from this point forward, we're going to refer to him as Paul because that's who he's amongst, Amen. if that makes sense. But Saul, now Paul, is filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that in that verse. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he goes after this guy. And he's harsh, mean, if you will. It's definitely not a nice moment, yes? But he does this while being filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of us struggle with that. We struggle with, can I be filled with God and yet harsh at the same time? What I would tell you is that Jesus did that. Jesus Jesus was not on the whole a harsh person. But when he was faced with religious hypocrites who were trying to stop other people from finding the truth, the harsh side of Jesus tended to come out. And that's what this guy is doing. All right, he keeps talking, verse 11. Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you. Still talking to Bar Jesus here. And you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. And then instantly mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and to lead him. Paul just worked a miracle right in front of the governor. And he struck the man blind. Again, seems harsh, and it is harsh. I will also say that it makes me very, very curious because if you were with us the week that we talked about Saul being reached by Jesus on the road to Damascus, do you remember what Jesus did to him? Jesus struck him blind. And why did Jesus strike Saul blind at that time? Because Saul was spiritually blind, but his physical eyes worked just fine. And he thought he was strong, but he was really weak. And so when Jesus comes in, he comes in with this very special tailored miracle right to Saul that was meant to wake him up and say, this is how you actually are. I'm going to make you wander around, not able to go anywhere because that's the way you are spiritually actually. 
It's a slap upside the head to wake up the stubborn. Nobody in here is stubborn. <laughs> Sometimes God deals with us like this. Amen. And this is the way he dealt with him. Then verse 12, and this is massive. This is, this is the main verse of the whole thing today. When the governor saw what happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. That verse right there is massive because the governor instantly becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. He surrenders. He gets saved. Pick, pick whatever words you want. But he believes. And that change, that surrender, that life change comes from two different things the verse just told us. First off, his reaction is because of what he just saw happen. The miracle that Saul did striking this man blind got through to him. But also it was the teaching about Jesus. He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So what happened? Two things actually came together. I heard the teaching about Jesus, and then I saw a miracle. And the combination of those two things pierced through to my heart. Amen. And that's the way many of us are. Sometimes we think we need just, just need the truth and the message to reach people. Other times we think we just need the power. But the governor needed both. He needed word and wonder. Word and wonder. Preaching and power. Message and miracle. I can keep going if you want. He needed both. Uh, you've been to churches that specialized in one. The church of Jesus Christ needs both. If people are going to believe the good news and hear the word about Jesus, the church of Jesus Christ needs both. And we need more churches that understand both things and how they work together. Word and wonder. Jesus told us that we would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Both. Not one or the other. I have people that come up to me sometimes as a pastor and they'll say, you know, all that Holy Spirit stuff and all that hearing from God stuff and, and all that power stuff, that's just not me, pastor. Like I didn't, I was raised that way. That's just not me. And, and here's a tough thing. And I, I mean this gently. Uh, Paul needed both. And you're not better than Paul. He needed both. And, uh, and I hope the scripture speaks that louder than I can speak it today. But it was the two things coming together that broke through. It was the same way with Jesus, right? In the gospels. Wasn't Jesus always doing miracles? Wasn't Jesus doing miracles so much in addition to his teaching that the two came together? Spirit and truth. And, and I mean, let's be real. The, the, the feeling across Jesus' ministry in the ancient world of the wonder of a supernatural God, it was palpable. You could taste it in the air. It was massive. He was known for it. People of that time, they, were knew, they knew they were in the middle of something. God had come near. You remember the time that uh, Peter was fishing and he wasn't doing very good at fishing and getting very many fish, which seems to be a constant thing from Peter. And Jesus does a miracle. And all of a sudden he gets a, such a large catch of fish that it starts to sink his boat. And if you know the story, P Peter responds so massively to what he sees in that moment. He rushes up onto the shore, falls down on his knees in front of Jesus and says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Because wonder and supernatural had come near. God himself had come near. And when God comes near like that, we respond in awe, holy fear. Yes. We know we're in the presence of something that is beyond us. And that's the way that he reacted that day. There's a, there a time when um, Jesus and the disciples were in a boat and there was a storm and they began to be afraid and they couldn't handle the storm. And, and Jesus gets up and Jesus talked to the weather. And commanded the weather. Peace be still. And the weather instantly changed. And the disciples say in Mark 4, they says the disciples were absolutely terrified when they watched this happen. Who is this man? They asked each other. It's like, well, you know who he is. He's Jesus. But that's not what they're asking. Like, what's really going on here? 
This is God in front of us. And that's terror. That's, that's the right kind of terror. That's, that's a holy awe yes. about who's in front of you. There's a time when Jesus is walking along down the street and there's a funeral procession that goes down the street and he walks up to the casket and it was a boy that had just died and his mom was a widow. And so she had just lost the only family that she had left. And Jesus touches the casket. And when he touches the casket, here's what happens. Luke 7, 15, when the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother and everybody there, great fear swept that crowd and they praised God saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people today. Some of you were taught to believe that God visited his people with Jesus and then stopped. Some of you were taught that God visited his people and it was palpable and there was holy awe there and then it stopped and that we in our modern times don't have any connection to that and that's, that's the message today. So in the same way that Jesus' disciples needed word and wonder, then you go into the book of Acts and they needed word and wonder as well. And today we need word and wonder as well. Amen. We need it the same way. Yesterday I was at a coffee shop with Mike Keybone uh, one of the pastors here locally, and we did the whole His Name is Jesus uh, together. He's one of the churches, and, and we were both there at this, one of these little hideouts that pastors have, you know, to write their Saturday messages. <laughs> and we were going over both of the things that we were putting together for our congregations today and just having a good time. And, and he stopped and, and said, you know what? He said, spiritual gifts are when you don't see your fingerprints on the thing anymore at all. It's God's fingerprints, Amen. and it's his alone. It's weird. So, sometimes in the past, spiritual gifts, you could tell the person was making it about themselves. You could tell it was attention-getting. You could tell it was selfishly motivated somehow. Even if it was out of their brokenness, it was, it was still putting the spotlight on them. But if it's a real spiritual gift, if it's a real miracle, the, the fingerprints aren't, aren't yours, Like Jesus did his miracles, but everything that Peter and John and the rest of them did after that, they knew it wasn't them doing it. That's right. They knew it was God working through them. They weren't magicians who decided what happened next. They partnered with the Holy Spirit and said, I'd like this person healed, please. Yes. And that's how that goes. When Saul walks in with the governor, he didn't do that miracle. You need to know that. He partnered with an all-powerful God who did the miracle. So his fingerprints weren't on it. And Kibo was like, when we did that whole, his name is Jesus thing back in uh, uh, Easter, he's like, there came out of it this unity that caught our whole community. Hallelujah. Definitely caught our churches, caught you, caught me. And he's like, and there's just something, especially when you look at it in the review mirror, you're like, man, our fingerprints weren't on that at all. We weren't smart enough to have done any of that. God did a thing. Praise God, God did a thing. Amen. Question is, do you want it in your life? Do you want word and wonder in your life? Yes. Right, talk about spiritual gifts. It, it, it is, it's tough because you, you've, you've got a past on this thing. Everybody does. We taught this first service and everybody's coming up to me afterward, tell me what their past is with spiritual gifts. Everybody's got a a weird story where somebody was weird. <laughs> yeah. I get it. Um, and there's, there's a thousand questions about spiritual gifts that I could try to answer, and I'm not going to attempt to answer any of them today. I'm just going to teach you what the Bible says about them. Um, maybe some other day we'll do a lengthy series just on spiritual gifts, and we'll try to go after all of those questions, but not today. I don't have time. Yeah. So there's things I'm going to, just warning you, I'm just going to blow past um, because I want to get you, get you the core of this thing. Um, but just quickly about the weirdness that you've seen where someone was immature or they were selfish or they were self-centered or something was unbiblical that was happening. I'll just say this. People are weird and the Holy Spirit isn't. The Holy Spirit is not. He will challenge you to leave yourself behind and fo to follow his way. 
Romans 12, verse 6 talks about it. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Just, I want to pause there real quick. Prophesy in accordance with your faith. In accordance with your faith means in accordance with your maturity as it exists today. Right? So some of you guys have got a gift and you don't have the character to match the gift. You're, you're just too young. And you might even look back on, on earlier years when you were using that gift and you did some goofy stuff. It's okay. That's where you were. But whatever gift God gives you, you need to grow in that. Right? Like you need to grow in Jesus so that your character does catch up to your gifting because you'll be a better minister for it. Verse seven, if it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. See how some of these don't look like fancy supernatural gifts, but they are. If it's encouraged, give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. Do you know leadership is a spiritual gift? If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The first thing I I really want you to notice there, it's each of us. Say each each of us. Each of us. That's challenging. So here's what that just said. If you are a Christian today, the Holy Spirit has distributed to you personally at least one spiritual gift. Every single person that knows Jesus. Because that said each of us. Also, we get different gifts and it tells us to use them. One of my spiritual gifts, I'm going to talk to you about some of the times that God has done spiritual gifts in my life so that you'll be able to see that the, how, this, how it's a part of my life. Um, it's, it's not intended to do any bragging or anything like that. If anything, um, hopefully what you'll feel by the end of it is that a lot of these things are small and kind of normal, but I see where the Spirit of God was in that. So I've always been a good teacher. I can teach people. Back when I was in technology, I was a software developer, but what they used me for for several years was to just teach people, just train people in how to use software because I was good at it. I could take complex things and help people how to understand complex things so they go forward in it. Sometimes I can inspire people. A lot of that, guys, is DNA. A lot of it's natural talent. I was born with it. And then you've got to start developing those natural talents into skills, right? And you get better and better and better at it. A lot of you guys have got those things in your life. But it wasn't a spiritual gift yet, right? Because I could teach people things, but I couldn't change a human heart. I couldn't actually bring real change to people. Even when I would inspire people, they'd be inspired for a day, but didn't change anybody. But when God gave me a gift of teaching, I started to see little bit by little bit, he would come in when he decided to, and he would add power to certain things that I would say. And some people would experience some change. And I've got to stand back from that and say, my fingerprints aren't on that one. Right? Like I I was involved. Thank God I was involved. but, But that was God doing that. It's beyond me. Um, I've had people come up uh, in this church and say, we've, we've been coming for a few months and it feels like every single week, it's like you read our minds and you're talking straight to us. I don't read minds. <laughs> Officially, God does though. Amen. Amen. God reads minds. Um, I just do what he says. And sometimes I'm teaching something with notes and And sometimes I just say certain things as I'm explaining a concept. And sometimes it only even comes out during one service. And the person comes up to me afterward and is like, that thing is a life-changing thing for me. And I'm like, thank you very much because I didn't work very hard on that at all. (laughs) I was so proud of this, though. It's so good. (laughs) A few months ago, uh, you might have been here. We we talked about uh, Jesus healing this man that was born blind. And he healed this man that was born blind, and, and um, his disciples asked him a question in the text and said, Is the guy, was the guy born blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And we had just a tiny little moment in there where um, I talked about the fact that uh, we should never blame people with any kind of a, a, a burden or a handicap as if it's punishment from God for them, and Jesus just established that there. And then we kind of moved on. 
Because honestly, that point in the teaching, I felt like I had to say it because Jesus did, but I didn't really care. The reason I didn't care about it is because I don't think anybody believes that anymore. That's nonsense. Who even thinks that anymore? So I didn't think much of it. I just kind of did my duty and and moved on. I got an email that night from a woman who had been born blind. And she was listening to the message online. And religious people had told her growing up that she had been struck blind by God because she was a sinful person. And she's like, and you said that in the middle of that message, and I was set free from that. My fingerprints aren't on that. Amen. I barely had anything to do with that. That's a gift of teaching. Word and wonder. God comes in supernaturally and says, I got this. Yes, yes. <laughs> <coughs> do you want to live that way? First Corinthians 12, 7 says, The purpose of the gift is, gifts are to help others. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Yes. It's not for you, it's for them. Do you see that? Uh, if somebody made it about them, you can see why that was wrong. God gives us gifts so that we can help other people see Jesus, so we can build up the church, so we can encourage, so we can strengthen. Those are the reasons that God gives gifts to us. It's very other, okay? The second thing it says about gifts is that your gift was handpicked for you. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So before I said each of you has a gift, that verse just said your gift was handpicked by God just for you. I don't think I read into that too much. Hmm. Last first Peter We need to use them. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. And you're supposed to use them, not sit on them. Some of you guys remember the parable of the talents, the person who buried their talent. You're supposed to use your gifts because the church needs you, needs the gift that God has handpicked for you. But then I got to show you this just really quick. Um, See the each of us there? (laughs) Each of us. Each of us gets a gift. Each person, each of you. I counted four different passages that I just stumbled on in this study. I didn't do it exhaustively. And it just keeps saying every single time, each of you got a gift. Do you know what it is? God wants you to. Each of you. Four times it said that. Next verse, First Thess- Thessalonians 5, 19. Don't quench or hate the wonder. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So verse 21 there is super important. We are supposed to test messages from God that people give to us. Um, We are not called to be gullible. One more time. We're not called to be gullible. Faith is not gullible. Test everything. Okay, bring somebody else in. Does this seem right to you? I'm going I'm to pray over that message that you just gave me from God. I'm going to test that against the scripture like the Bereans did. We'll talk about that some other time. But I'm going to test it. Absolutely, that's important. But don't quench the spirit either. See the balance there. Quench. It, it's, it's, it's talking about the spirit as if the spirit is a fire and you can throw a bucket of water on it which seems weird, right? What do you mean I can throw a bucket of water on God and put out the flame? But it's true. Why? Because an omnipotent God decided to give you power. And this is consistent with him. The kingdom of your own soul, God has given you the keys to it. And for every single step that you take toward Jesus Christ or in your walk with Jesus Christ is your choice. He gave it to you. You're the one who decided whether or not you would be saved and surrender your entire life and soul to Jesus. That was your choice. And then people get stopped at baptism, right? They're like, I got saved, but I don't want to get water baptized. And they stay stuck there for a while. Why do they stay stuck? Because it's your choice. You have to surrender to that choice. It's yours. That's very important to God. Will you come to church? That's your choice. Will you read the Bible? That's your choice. Will you invite the Holy Spirit into your life and his gifts? Your choice. 
Some of you are like, I, I wish I didn't have so many choices. <laughs> right? That's how I feel sometimes. I wish I could just say carte blanche to God. Like, you, you just, you know, do it all, please. Yeah. <laughs> do it all. Don't quench the spirit, though, because you can. And don't despise prophecies. You may have been heard in the past. You may have reason to be skeptical, but don't bring a deep spirit of skepticism to the spiritual gifts. Yes. Don't despise them. Next, uh, 1 Corinthians 14.1. This is the verse that um, God has most moved in my life through to challenge me on this road. Pursue love, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. 1 Corinthians 14.1. Pursue love. We get that part. That makes sense. That sounds like Jesus. And then earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Hold on. I'm supposed to want them earnestly. I looked up the Greek word behind earnestly there, and it means earnestly. <laughs> it means passionately. It means zealously to chase after something. This is the kind of language. He could have just said desire them. He says earnestly desire them. Like there should be such a longing in you. Why? For more of God. A hunger for more of God. Never satisfied, never done, never stuck, but always wanting God. If you've got something more for me, I want it. Give it to me. How do I pray more for it? How do I bring others around me to pray with me for whatever you have for me? Because some of us are in this room and we're reading all this. Each of us has one kind of stuff and God hand selected, hand picked one for you and you're not walking in it yet. So how do I get there? First off, you got to desire it. You got to want it. And people who want it, they're going to pray for it. It's on the other side of surrender. A few months ago, there was a, here's another story, um, a woman here at Grace, and we were having our prayer meeting before first service, and we go into the green room, and the whole worship team comes together, and, and we pray over the services all day, and I explained to them where the service was going, and it was, I'll just tell you this, it was kind of focused on uh, Christians, and just teaching them some stuff that they needed to take their next steps, and um, anyway, there was a woman, and and God has been pouring out on her visions and dreams across the last year. It's relatively new in her life. And she's like, I had a vision this morning. And it was a whole lot of people who were blindly stumbling around in the dark and couldn't tell where they were going. And the whole time they were saying out loud in the vision, we can see, we can see, we can see. And they were self-deceived. And I had this moment where she said that. And the Holy Spirit inside of my heart said amen to it. And I knew I was supposed to do something with that. And I decided to put a salvation explanation and prayer into the message that day. Because God had come in and said, I've got other plans. That was her spiritual gift. <coughs> As kindly as I can say, stop having low expectations of God. Stop having low expectations of God. Stop looking at all the wonder and thinking it was long ago and allowing a seed of doubt to come into your faith that says maybe none of it was real in the first place. God wants to come in and he wants to blow your mind on how real he is right now in your life right now so that you will draw the connection and you will know that God is here. He has come for his people and he has come for you. Jesus said you could have life and have it abundantly. Be hungry. Paul wrote a letter to a younger pastor. This is later in his life. Uh, the young pastor's name was Timothy. So here's 2 Timothy 1. Look at what he says to him. He says, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift, gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So there's some really big stuff that he says to Timothy there. First off, there was a spiritual gift. It was evangelism, actually, if you read it in context, that Timothy did not have until there was a prayer meeting and Paul prayed over him 
And then Timothy got this new gift of evangelism. So that's one way we can get gifts is when we bring the body of Christ and community in around us and say, please help me pray for this. But the second thing that you see is Timothy used to have that gift of evangelism and the flame was burning really, really high. And then over time, it started to diminish. The flame went out. And Paul's like, you have the power, Timothy, to fan it back into flame. So I just say, let that challenge you today. Because some of you guys are like, I don't have a problem theologically with spiritual gifts. And I'm comfortable with the gifts that God has given me. But have the flames gone low for you? Have you set those gifts aside? Have you put them on a shelf? Have you stopped using them? Back to the parable of the talents. Don't bury that thing. Maybe you need to use it. The church needs you. Fan it into flame. Okay. Take a drink of water for this one. Years ago, I've got just a few more stories to tell you before we're done. (laughs) Just so you see the practicals. Years ago, God gave me um, what some people call a supernatural language to pray in. Um, for some of you, you weren't freaked out in the message yet, and now you are. <laughs> um, I'm not going to explain a whole lot about that. But he gave me that supernatural language to pray in. It's not English. I don't know what it is. I, I pray in it. He knows what it is. And, um, and this started years ago, and I'm not religious about it, and I'm not weird about it. I, I pray that privately. Um, God uses that in my personal walk with him, and I, I, I have no need to bring that uh, into any kind of public context. <clears throat> Sometimes you're in a spot with God where you know you need to pray something and the emotions are too great or the mystery of the thing is too great. You don't know the way out. You don't know the way forward. And you just need to say something to God and you don't know what. And this is how God uses this gift for me. He says, then just pray this way. And sometimes I do. And sometimes he has used it for intercession. Um, Here's an example Um, Back when I was living in Illinois, um, I was an elder at the church there, and I became aware of a couple, a married couple, who was in crisis, and they were about to to split and maybe divorce. And we'd been made aware of that as church leaders and asked to pray for them. And I got in my red F-150 and was driving from East Peoria, Illinois to Morton where my home was. And as soon as I got into the car, I began to pray in English and the Holy Spirit just came into the moment and said, I would like you to shift. And so I shifted. And as I did, I began to weep. And all this emotion came out of nowhere And I was beginning to feel things in that prayer while I was praying out loud, not knowing what the words were. And I'm literally sobbing in the cab of this truck. Struggling to see the road, by the way. There's a lesson there. And I just prayed that out. And I got to the end of that prayer and it was just done. And I said, amen. And I'm like, man, God, who was that for? And here's mystery. I don't know who it was for. Like I was entering into someone's deep pain. There was agony that I was experiencing, but it wasn't mine. Was it the wife? Was it the husband? Was it God's agony about them? I don't know. But it's a mystery is okay. And it was okay. And I just said, Lord, you know. And you wanted that prayer prayed. And I was your vessel to pray it. That kind of thing doesn't happen a lot, but it happened. I hope you're okay. When I was in high school, I've told this story before. I was the shyest kid in the world. Didn't know how to talk to people. Didn't know how to approach new people. And all that shyness was like bondage over me. And I was the lonely, one of the loneliest people you would ever, ever have met. Just really in a lot of pain. 
when I became a Christian and went off to college, one of the things that God gave me, and I didn't even know it was happening at the time, is he gave me this gift of evangelism, which is the craziest thing in the world for a shy kid. Because instantly, it was like the very next day, I could walk up to anybody and I'd never met him before. Just, what's your name? Tell me about you. Let's go. And, and I was just meeting everybody. And, and we had maybe eight different cafeterias at that uh, college. And I felt like the Lord said on, you know, maybe my first month or two there said, I don't ever want you to sit down for this first year and sit with anybody that you know. I want you to walk into every cafeteria you go in for every meal. And I want you to find somebody you've never met before and sit down and just talk with them. And I didn't tell everybody about Jesus, okay? I wasn't pushy. Don't be pushy. Don't make people projects. I was just meeting people. But in the course of that, I met a guy named Steve, just sat down and met this guy named Steve. And Steve had been a Christian, had been raised as a Christian, but was far from God and hadn't walked with him in forever. And me and this other guy, Joe, were starting up this new Bible study. And I'm like, Steve, you ought to come to this Bible study. And so Steve did. And I got to know Steve. Steve became one of my best friends. Steve stood up at my wedding. I saw Steve become a Christian. Steve's a pastor today. God took a shy, lonely kid, made him overnight an evangelist supernaturally. Don't, don't exp- I don't know how to explain it. And did things. Word and wonder. One last story. See, this stuff is happening all around you. And some of you just didn't know. Um, there's a man and goes here to Grace. His name's Jim. Some of you guys know Jim. And Jim gets prophetic words about people. And Jim's not flashy about it. He doesn't make a show. But we'll be in the middle of service and Jim will get a message about a person. And he'll walk over to me because he's super humble. And he, he won't even speak to that person what his word is unless his wife is right next to him. And he'll come up and he'll ask me and he'll point to a person during the last song and say, I've got a word for them. And Pointing's rude for those of you who've never been taught that. Um, but he'll say, hey, I've got a word for this person. Is that okay? And he always says, is that okay? Because he's just a humble guy. And most of the time, I know the person he's pointing at because I'm their pastor and I know what they're going through right now and I know what their prayer requests are. And almost always I'm smiling on the inside because I'm like, yeah, Jim, they need a word today. And then I watch him go and speak whatever super specific message God is giving them and then I just watch the tears come down. And this happens all the time around this church, guys. Again, we don't make a big deal out of it. This is individual stuff and God is doing work, but there's wonder here. And I get to watch it. And why are they crying? Because the God of all the universe decided to make an issue out of them today. Counted them worthy of a miracle. They got their miracle probably in their darkest time. Don't we need that? We need it. Would you guys stand? Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to give you three options for your challenge. Option number one is I'm going to pray that God would pour out his gifts. If you know Jesus today, that God would reveal to you and pour out his gift on you that you might never even have known about today before you leave the, the room. And many of you are going to get that. That's option one. Option two is some of you need to go to our prayer teams in the back corner. They're always there and the the prayer room is back there. And you need someone else to come and pray with you, kind of like Paul did with Timothy. Say, pray for me about receiving whatever my gift is. You just might need somebody to put their arm around you, lead you by the hand. So go do that before you leave. That's option two. Option three is you need to take your notes and the the passages of scripture that I've walked through and you might need to go deeper. 
and you know who you are. And you need to take a Sabbath. You need to take a whole morning. You need to drive up to Mount Scott. You need to go somewhere. A whole afternoon, a whole day. Be deluxe with yourself. And take the scripture and open it up again and ask God to speak to you through the text. I'm still feeling stubborn, Lord, about this. Would you break through to me? You ever pray that kind of prayer? It's risky. That's option three. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray right now, Lord, for the opening of hearts across this room and online. I pray that you would put within us what 1 Corinthians said, an eager desiring for the gifts in our life. Help us to be hungry for more of God. And Lord, we ask you right now, pour out your gifts on us. Show us how you want to move in our life. Let others come and confirm it. Pour that out all across this room today, Lord. And Jesus, for, for those of us, God, that just need to take a few more steps with you, just go a little bit deeper on this stuff. Lord, I pray that you would help us through that. Help us to be faithful. Help us to take the challenge. It's easy to feel something. It's easy to think something and walk out through those magic doors and just forget all about it. But God, give us follow through and obedience. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.